that song, it's one of those songs. You know what I mean? It's, it's one of those where, especially when, I mean, the song leader has to lead it before you, you're the one to get up and preach. Uh, not you, but me. I mean, you might be there someday, but, or have been. But it's one of those you think, and Cody's shaking his head. But it's one of those where you, you feel like you need to get up here and have a moment of silence or something, just to, to take it in a bit more. We're not going to do that, okay? But it, it's a thought. I am glad you're here tonight. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your presence. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful for another opportunity, another occasion to be in God's Word together. Of course, to sing and pray, and now to open up His Word. We are going to be in Philippians once more this evening for this, I don't know, I guess we can call it a three-parter. We, we skipped one Sunday evening. We've been looking at the mind in Philippians, the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. And so tonight, we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, mind meditates, mind meditate. And you'll have to excuse me, I told Gary he might have needed this. Uh, I'm going to open up my tea here if I can get this package open. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Okay. See, I didn't plan this very well. Well, that's not wanting to open. Okay. Don't you love it when a good illustration goes wrong? All right. Okay, I got my tea bag here. We're just going to set that in there. I'm going to, hmm, where do I want to put this? I'll put it right here. Is that okay? Can you all watch that for me and make sure it does its thing? All right. Don't forget that. <clears throat> A penny for your thoughts. Some of you might have seen the old-time Twilight Zone episode with that as its title. Now, if you haven't, you at least reckon probably, now there might be a few of you in here, I really like this front row. is a great front row up here. Appreciate them. They might not have even heard that phrase. But I know some of us in here have heard the phrase, a penny for your thoughts. So I, I could ask tonight, what are you thinking? And I'm not going to try to be like the guy in the Twilight Zone episode who was given the power to read or to hear the thoughts of other human beings, to read minds, as it were. And if you, if you don't know, that doesn't end well at all for that person. You know, sometimes we like to think or we think we'd like to know. I want to know what somebody's thinking, but in reality, we might not want to have that power I don't know how well we'd handle it, as well, at least not as well as God does. But that is one way of asking or turning this sermon into a question. You could ask, what am I thinking? Not just right now, but the rest of this evening, this week, we're starting a new, brand new week. What am I going to be thinking about? What am I going to really dwell on this week? I don't know how much we think anymore as a culture. A couple of hundred years ago and beyond, people seemed, in my estimation, to do a lot more actual, deep thinking, or to use that word, meditating, the mind that meditates. They would go on walks. Just, they'd just take a walk through the countryside for that very purpose, just to get away from, I mean, they thought they had to get away from all of the noise and distractions of daily life. They'd take a walk out in the country just to think. And they didn't have their Walkman with them or their phone or their earbuds in. They would just think. Or they would sit alone at their, in, their, in a room at their house and nothing, doing nothing else but just sitting there thinking. And then, I'm going to meddle for just a moment and then we'll move on, but then we wonder why maybe we don't produce as much depth when it comes to content why our books, and of course, you move beyond to other media, it just goes downhill in a lot of ways. Not entirely, thankfully. But thinking, serious stuff. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. Thinking is serious business. I think I need to hit a button. Or you have the other one in Proverbs 4, verse 23, where we're warned to guard or keep, hold on to your heart, guard your heart, your mind, your thinking, center of thinking, your seat of emotions, you guard that because out of it flows or springs the issues of life. 
how we think, what we think, it is no small matter. So we come to to the the basic idea of Philippians chapter 4. If you haven't already guessed it, verse 8 is where we're going to spend some of our time tonight. We're going to start there and end there, as it were. But we are to meditate, to think thoroughly. We are to meditate on God. You can't get anything higher or better or deeper to meditate on than God. You've got an infinite topic. I hate to use that word, that that pales to describe God, a topic. But you have an infinite thing to think about, God. But then I'd also include and good, good, which comes from God. But part of what I mean by that tonight is it doesn't have to be something that we would typically label in the category of spiritual or religious. There are, there are some things that, we, that are good to think on and that are innocent and healthy and appropriate that aren't necessarily what we would traditionally place in that box. There's a lot of good things just in our world we might miss if we're not careful. And we'll, we'll get to that a, a little bit more in a moment. Here's our plan tonight. Let's take a look at the idea first, and then the list. The idea behind or underlying Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. The idea of a mind that meditates. And then we'll come back to the actual list of about eight different specific examples that are then given for us in that verse, Philippians 4, verse 8. By the way, I don't know if you've been keeping track. I might have been. But you can put these three lessons on the mind in Philippians together into one statement, if you will. The first one was one, mind that is one. Then last week was prize. I think I heard somebody whisper it, so we've got one of you out there. That makes two of us. And then tonight is meditate. So you can put those together and say that in Philippians, we are called as God's people to have one prize to meditate and to think about, pun intended. Here we go. The idea. The idea in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Let's turn there together and read the passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Unsurprisingly, as we near the end of this brief letter, we read the word, finally. I am reading tonight from the NASB, or the New American Standard version, kind of going back to some of my roots. But it writes, it says this in Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on thee That's the idea. It's at the end of the verse. There are a few versions that put it at the start of the verse, that here's some things to think on. And that might, that's more likely what you have tonight before your eyes that you hold in your hand is the phrase, think on. Put your mind, there's that mind, on these things. Think on. Part of the reason that the, the, in it, the, in it, the NASB has dwell there. It's because of the tense and the context. That It's not that Paul says, I want you to just think about these things a little, or here, you read the verse, there you go, now you've thought about them, right? They entered your mind, hopefully, if you're reading with any kind of mental attention. But that's not really the idea, is it? The idea to think on means you think about it, and you keep thinking about it. The things like this are to be what fills our minds. You dwell on these thoughts. Let's explore this idea outside of this context for a moment or two. Let's go all the way back to the Psalms. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. This is one of those quotable Psalms. The first verse gives us the negative side. And then verse 2 transitions now to the positive in describing this man who is so blessed. Psalm 1, verse 2. Let's watch for our word, our key word tonight. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, and for our study here, we're using the, the idea of his word in general, the scriptures, the Bible, for, for the psalmist, the law. In his law, what does it say? He meditates day and night. So you have what his joy is, and then you have the word meditate itself, which is a different word, of course, than what Paul uses in Philippians 4a, although you might make them cousins or something, they're related. But then he doesn't just say meditates. That, that could be five minutes every Sunday. Or that could be maybe half an hour every Sunday morning, right? He says he meditates day and night. I don't take that to mean that this is a, an, a total 24-7 thing. That, that might not even be respectful when you have other things you have to attend to mentally. But it's that this is an ongoing, consistent way of thinking deeply about God. I do have a couple other passages for your own consideration. I don't know if they're up there. Okay, there they are. All right. Do you know why I chose these two pictures? I told somebody this afternoon I was going to get a little graphic with it tonight. But hope it doesn't. I mean, maybe you haven't ate dinner yet, so you're okay. It's because of this word here in Psalm 1-2. Meditates. There, there are at least two examples of this that the Jews, when they read this, would have understood. One, was that that lion, as he gets his meal, his dinner, this one's likely in a zoo, right? So it's a little different, but the same idea, I guess. But he, he gets to pray, and he gets his food, and as he starts to dig in to his dinner, there's this little growl, or this, if we equated it to a domestic cat, it's a purr, right? It's a sigh. Mm. We do that, don't we? Maybe you did that at lunch today, when the waitress brought your dinner, or when mama brought Easter dinner and set it on the table, you, ah, and then it's, Mmm, this is good. That's what the word means. So he says when he approaches the word of God, it's like he's digging in for his, his favorite meal. Mm. The other one, are you awake? Somebody jumped over here. I don't know if anybody, I was looking that direction, so my peripheral is not that good. But the other way of looking, one other way of looking at it, I know we've got some cattlemen in here tonight, one or two maybe, but is the cow chewing, what, is, what do they do? The cud, yeah, with all their stomachs and how it goes into the one that's kind of like a reservoir to store it for a while, and they just chew it enough to get there, and then, they, then it comes back up. And again, I'm not trying to, to upset your stomach or anything or ruin dinner, but that's also what this word means. You, you take something, and, and you might say just really quickly reading the Bible, and that has its place, that's the initial chewing of the cow. The initial taking it in. But meditating, thinking deeply like this means you bring it back to your mind. You might even set the Bible aside for a moment before you keep reading more. And you just sit there and think mull over and over repeating the phrase or the word or even moving on to other ideas that that might stimulate in your mind. You just sit there and think about it. Maybe it's your, maybe you start your day, you're in your day, or you eat, when you eat lunch, maybe you get on your phone a, a daily Bible reading or a little scripture. Maybe it's that you read just one verse and you, you spend part of your day. And you have a moment when you don't have to really think about something else. You're, you're driving, you don't want to drive too mindlessly, but... Okay, so don't recommend, take that as a recommendation, but you see where I'm going. You ever do that where there's something that you think about? We do that with problems, <laughs> trying to solve them. We do that with, with anxieties. We do that with memories, a big event that's just happened, something we've witnessed. Maybe it's the birth of a child, or it's a wedding, or, or maybe it's something sad that stays with us for that day, maybe for days and months and years to come, and we do that thing, we 
We do what it said in Philippians 4 8. We dwell there mentally. Do we ever do that with His Word? Because if, if there's anything that's worthy of praise, if there's anything that's lovely, and there's some ugly parts too, it would be this, this book, His Word. Let's turn to Proverbs now. We've mentioned a couple of verses from Proverbs. Let's do an exercise in Proverbs chapter 26. Should be verse 13. I stole this idea, giving credit where credit is due. A couple of years ago or so, I, I was listening to a podcast and ran across someone that used this. Part of what they did was use this as an, an example of meditating. Proverbs 26. I'm in 23. All right, Proverbs 26, verse 13. He's talking about the wise man and the foolish man, and so one of the, the types, subtypes of the foolish man in Proverbs is the lazy man or the sluggard. Proverbs 26, verse 13 says this. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. There's a lion outside my house. A lion is in the open square. And then he says, as the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. He just rolls back over in bed. I'm not getting up. I'm not going to go meet the day. That lion's going to eat me. And no, I didn't really intentionally plan for the lion to come up twice. That just worked out nicely. So thank you for that. But this, the, the idea here is you can take that statement about the lion. As you start meditating on it, you can ask some questions as you meditate. One question would be, is this real? Is there really a lion outside his house? Is that really the reality here? Maybe. Probably not. And so then you can get to these other words. You've got the word lazy, but then and you can make a really nice alliterated sermon out of it. Okay? But then you have either being lazy makes you a liar, or he's just lying, he's just making it up. Lying to himself, lying to, if he's speaking to somebody in his house, he's lying. Or, and I don't know if you're allowed to use this word in a sermon, but I'm going to use it. It makes you a liar or a lunatic. It takes away your sensibility. What if he's not lying in the sense that he really believes it? And it's still not true, it's still a lie, but it's more that he's lost his sense of reality. He's so caught up in his laziness that he really believes there's a lion outside, or whatever the danger is in the case, specific case. What does it do to you? See, so you can take one proverb and start thinking about it. How does that work out? What does it mean when he says there's a lion outside? How, how does that work? And then, of course, if it is real, this one doesn't start with an L, but the laziness also could lead you to cowardice. What if it really is real? Now, I know somebody here might pick a bone of that and say, well, if there's a lion outside my house, that's not cowardice, that's wisdom, to not go outside. You can take that up at a later time. There's an exercise tonight. In one verse, one proverb of wisdom, and how, and the proverbs are one of those parts of Scripture that are really meant, where you get this one pithy statement that so much is wrapped up in. You're meant to think about it. You're not meant to read it once and move on. Now let's come back to the New Testament scriptures, making our way back to Philippians 4, verse 8. Let's look now at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. The idea is also that of total absorption. Total absorption. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 through 4, 16. These are the, some of the instructions from Paul through the Holy Spirit to young Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 through 16, he tells him this. There's a lot here that is beyond the scope of this, this look. But he says, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and teaching. 
Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. And then look at this. Watch this, verse 15. Take pains with these things. Some have meditate. Take pains. Be absorbed in them. And if you have the word absorbed or something like that, it's in italics because this literally is exist, take up your existence in these things. We talk about all in. Totally absorbing these things. So that, look what happens. Your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Preserve in these things or persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Totally. Dwell on these things. I cannot make a cup or any kind of tea, if it's a cup or making a whole saucer, not saucer, that's the word I'm looking for. Pitcher, thank you, thank you. Pitcher of tea without thinking. At least I can't remember a time in, in months, years, really. Where every time I make tea, and it's one of those deals where once you know those ruts in your brain get deeper every time you think about it, and so and until I lose my mind completely, I don't, I don't know I ever make tea. It's usually when I take the tea bags out and start dropping them in, or in this case, just one for a cup. But I, I don't think about Philippians four verse eight. Have you ever left your tea bags in the tea too long? Depending on the type of tea and all of that and how long, and maybe you're one of those people, you like it, but you, you can get some really, really bitter tea. I know some of us like our coffee strong, maybe, maybe we like our tea strong, but you can leave it in there long enough that that water absorbs, you see the idea, it absorbs that tea so much that it's just so strong, so bitter. That's the idea. Of Philippians 4 8 and these other passages, don't drink my tea, okay? That's the idea, isn't it? Is you allow God and good things, God and His world. We mentioned His word, but you can go to His general revelation, His creation. Go back to the song we mentioned this morning This is my Father's world. You take in those things, let those things be what dominates your thinking. We can. If these passages are true, and I believe they are, it is possible for us to control what happens up here. That doesn't mean there will not be these thoughts that creep in. It might be when you see something or you see someone, you get an impure thought that starts making its way in, or you get a prideful or an envious thought or a, a hateful thought. But as you know, you don't have to let those thoughts take over. You can fight and push them back and then replace them with good thoughts. That's why Paul doesn't say, don't think about this. There are passages of Scripture that tell us, don't think about certain things. But there's a reason why he says, I want you to think about these things, and they're all positive. I want you to think on these things. That brings us then from the idea of meditating and thinking deeply to the list itself. And let's make our way back to Philippians 4. As you do that, before we read the verse again, I thought it fitting to read it twice tonight so we would get the verse at least in our heads a couple of times. But I ran across this quote. He's writing about Philippians 4, verse 8. The writer says, The command in verse 8 to think about all the wonderful and lovely things listed here runs directly opposite to the habits of the mind instilled by the modern media. Read the newspapers. I know not too many people do that anymore, but their stock in trade is anything that is untrue, unholy, 
unjust, impure, ugly, of ill repute, vicious, and blameworthy. You see what he did there with Philippians 4, verse 8? And then he asked. I, I realize there are some good things in there's some good articles out there, and there's good news reports and things, but I think he's on to something as a general rule, whether it's the TV news media or social media or whatever it is. He says, is, this, is that a true representation of God's good and beautiful world? How are you going to celebrate the goodness of the Creator? If you feed your mind only, that word only is important, the word feed, but only on the places in the world which humans have made ugly. How are you going to take steps to fill your mind instead with all the things God has given us to be legitimately pleased with and to enjoy and celebrate? How are you going to do it? The list. Philippians 4, verse 8. Let's go back one more time. I have them on the screen as well. And then my daughter, when she got here and saw the handout, I don't let her cheat anymore. But she wondered about that large space at the bottom, and then there's a space on the back. And that's for you. You don't have to do it right now. You can if, you're, if you want. That's I'm just, I'm just giving you some options. I don't expect you necessarily to do it right now. But there should be enough room, even if, you have to, even if you have to go on the back page, to write out all eight. And I encourage you to take the time to do that sometime. One of the best ways to get something in our heads to begin with is to take and write it. Typing it is not the same thing. Keep that in mind, even medically speaking. But let's read it. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true... Whatever is honorable, true, based on reality. We, we hear so much about false things. There, there's the whole phenomenon now that's been created of, of, what, fake news. There, there's a lot of places to find fake stuff. He says, don't, don't fill your mind with that. Whatever is honorable. Part of this word includes the idea, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on these because this is not a dictionary class, but part of that idea is something that has weight to it. It's weighty. There's a dignity here. And as a people, I don't know if, if we've completely lost it, but we're losing it, our sense of dignity. I, I don't mean that to say that we can't have fun, you can't, but there, there's some things that are weighty, they're heavy, and they're not meant to be lightened. Honorable. Whatever is right, it's the same word we translate righteousness. Whatever is pure, it's the same word or at least a root of it we translate holy and sacred. Holy. Whatever is lovely. Are there things you can think about that you just, if you could see them in the moment, you'd want to do this with, you'd want to hold and embrace? Are there people, are there activities, are there things that are worthy of being embraced? Things you need to love. There's a lot of things out there the Christian needs to hate. But there's a lot we need to love, too. Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, Whatever you can, you could tell to somebody else, put it in that context, and it wouldn't be gossip or discouraging. It would be commendable, as the English standard says. And then lastly, if there's anything worthy of praise, what might be a summary of them all, dwell on these things. The list. This is true in the athletic competitive world. That the mind game, depending on the sport, most sports and most coaches and Olympic athletes, if you've read any of their material, their books, they'll tell you that it's about a 90-10, usually. 
that only 10% is the physical techniques and the working out and the physique, that 90% of your performance is based on what happens in your noggin. You'll also learn that you can't force yourself to not think about certain things. If you start getting nervous before the match or the game, you can't just say, don't be nervous. Stop thinking about what might go wrong. You can't do it. Not really. That that vacuum has to be filled. That the way to stop the negative thoughts or the way to stop the sinful thoughts is to replace them. And it's not just psychology. But it's to meditate on what's good, on what's beautiful. Whether that is the beauty of a sunset, the power of the created, transforming word of God, or it's the innocence of a three-year-old, or the wisdom of a 95-year-old. There's a lot we can meditate. The idea, mind, meditate. Then the list. Paul gets us started with some good things to think about. We are to meditate on God and good. And then that last question, Ben, and I think it's on the screen. We're going to end with that title slide. But do you see it? What? are we going to think about this week? Tonight's sermon is not so much what are you going to do, what are you going to think? And that's part because what we think about leads to what we feel. And those two lead to what we say and do. And what we say and do leads to our habits and pattern of our whole life. Gary selected, we've already looked at it, the invitation song, to a call from God himself. It's not really from me or the elders. We're a part of the work, but it's from God. To be a Christian, to become a Christian, to think, to meditate on these things. Have you seen Paul, Paul Alexander? To the best of my knowledge, he's still living in Texas. He turns 70, or he'll turn 76 this year. He has spent almost seven decades, almost completely during that time, paralyzed from here down. You can look him up, Google it, YouTube it. There's videos about him, videos of him. It's an amazing story. He, got, he went to college and got his master's. He was a lawyer for a while. He said he was a pretty good one too. He wrote a book holding a pen or a pencil in his mouth. Because he, he's, he can talk fairly well. He can read. He can listen to things. And I thought about the fact he can what would it be like to be paralyzed, the man in an iron lung, for 70 years? Now, thinking too much can be dangerous if we, if we get too locked inside. I, I understand that, but I wonder, what would we do if we were forced, in a sense, to do a lot of deep thinking? Mind. Meditate. Let's stand and sing together.